pleasure to see everyone here. Uh, thank you for coming. Our second speaker for our speaker series is Janice Littlejohn. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> she is the producer of the jazz documentary titled, But Can She Play? And today's talk will be a window into the lives and the music of some many talented jazz musicians, specifically women, and the barriers or obstacles that they have faced over the arc of their career, and potentially some of the structural roadblocks that we have in place um, for them despite um, their natural given talent. So um, please feel free uh, to ask any questions. We will also be Skyping in a um, trombonist. A trumpet player. A trumpet player, and so we'll be able to engage with a working professional um, musician as well. So without further ado, Janice. Thank you. How is everybody doing today? I'm doing, I'm doing well, thank you. I want to first take this opportunity to thank all of you here at La Jolla Country Day School for making me feel so welcome while I'm here subbing for Amy Parrish. Um, it has been really delightful to be here and to be with your students. They're amazing young people, um, and I know that's all credited to you. And so um, it's been a, dear, a real pleasure. I'd also like to take an opportunity to thank Colleen for uh, making this available to me and um, being very excited about the topic. It's something that's very passionate to me and something that I wanted to talk to you guys a little bit about today. So, I am the director and producer of a work in progress documentary called But Can She Play? which will center on the work, the music, and the activism of jazz women, sax, and brass players. Now when I tell people I'm working on a documentary project about women, sax, and brass players, the first question I get is, well, are you a musician? No. The second question is then, well, why are you interested in doing a film about women horn players? That answer is a little more later. So let me take you back a few years. Actually, it's been about 10. And at that time, I was attending the University of Southern California and trying to decide on a topic for my thesis project. All I knew was that it was going to be fiction, and I was determined to become a novelist. By then, I had spent 22 years as an arts and entertainment journalist, and for nine of those years, I had been a freelance writer. And I wanted to switch gears. I wanted to write books and plays. I wanted to create art, rather than report on someone else's. And as I was researching, for some divine inspiration, or rather rummaging through some old file boxes and procrastinating on the task at hand, I came across a story I had written a few years earlier about the revitalization of Central Avenue and an interview I had done with a trumpet player named Clara Bryant. After workshopping a short story that I devised loosely based on Bryant, it was about a fictionalized female jazz player set in the 1940s during Los Angeles's jazz heyday, and my thesis topic became clear, and not just because I got an A on the short story. It was because my professor, who was also a noted novelist and historian in her own right, suggested that although I had written the piece well, this story about a woman trumpet player was too fantastical to be believed. She said, and I quote, that just didn't happen back then. Not only did it happen back then, but women instrumentalists have played key roles in the music from its inception. Now while it's true that jazz as a musical genre was rooted in African American communities in New Orleans in the 19th and early 20th centuries, it was in 1930 that Los Angeles saxophonist, composer, and band clinician, Catherine E. Thompson, released the Ragtime Saxophonist under her initials K.E. Thompson, and it is the first published jazz method book used for saxophone. 
all-female jazz bands during the Second World War kept this country together and dancing while the men were off fighting. There were hundreds of women-led groups barnstorming the ballrooms, dance halls, and makeshift USO stages at home and abroad. John Coltrane could spend hours at home, upstairs, meditating, praying, and creating his masterwork, A Love Supreme, because his wife, pianist, harpist, and composer, Alice Coltrane, was downstairs taking care of the children and supporting them with her art. Without pianist, composer, band leader, Lil Hardin Armstrong, Louis Armstrong would have never ventured to center stage. There had, had there been no Mary Lou Williams, Dizzy Gillespie would have never found himself in the land of Ubladi. It was Mary Lou who wrote and composed his signature 1945 song. Trombonist Melba Liston not only mentored the likes of Quincy Jones, she played with the boys in the big bands from Gillespie to Count Basie, and she collaborated with Ray Charles and Joe Sample and recorded with Dexter Gordon. And because the music was good, everybody could play. And yet the stories and contributions of these women have largely gone unsung. Why? Because it's men who have written the history, leaving women out not only in the literary canon, but out of the cinematic canons as well. And Ken Burns gives us a 10-episode documentary covering jazz from, the from 1917 to 2001, and only one woman, Mary Lou Williams, is featured. So that's why I'm doing the documentary. <laughs> and I'd like to take a quick moment to show you a little snippet from the work in progress reel I created a few years ago to showcase for grants and potential funders. There are so many women involved in, over the years in jazz that I, I hate to say neglected, but they just haven't stood in the forefront. Women are coming forward. They just deserve to have more spotlight than they're given. I really believe that women are really shut out uh, from jobs when it comes to jazz. So we're here to support blind auditions. For most of the women jazz musicians I know, we really don't want to be considered female jazz musicians. We just want to be seen as musicians. It's not every day that every single person in the band is a woman. Jazz instruments are not considered soft and females are considered to be more soft and feminine. Being a female in jazz does not necessarily mean that you don't have to be feminine. And when they give like a girl a compliment, oh yeah, you're sounding like an old dude, you know, or an old man, that's considered a compliment. I never realized that there was anything different being a woman playing trombone until probably college. That's where I came up against men, older men, usually. I didn't know girls played the trombone. Like, what decade are you from? I take great pleasure in breaking those boundaries and just showing the world a woman can be many things, not just uh, the roles that society kind of carves out for us. Featured in the clip are trombonist Jennifer Warden, saxophonist Grace Kelly, Tia Fuller, who you heard as you were coming in, Kaylee Neiswanger, and others. And leading us out of that clip was trumpeter Crystal J. Torres, who is currently on tour with Beyonce, who I would like to point out has employed more women jazz musicians in her touring band over the last 10 years than the SF Jazz Orchestra, the Duke Ellington Orchestra, and the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra combined. I'll get back to that. The title of this documentary 
which is also curious for some, is, but can she play? And it's an old refrain, but one that most mu women musicians, particularly women horn players, continue to hear when going out for gigs. It's, well, I know her daddy is one of the top drummers in the country, but can she play? It's, I hear she studied at Berkeley, but can she play? For my favorite, which was a riff embedded into the lead in in the title track of saxophone, saxophonist Candy Dolfer's first CD, Sexuality, I know she looks good, but can she play? Even older are the stories of sexual harassment and rape among band members. It happened to Melba Liston, and it happened to Mary Lou Williams back in their day. About four years ago, I received an email from a female saxophone player describing the intense pain and despair she felt trying to survive in a misogynistic world of jazz. Two months later, she committed suicide. And in May of this year, Juilliard trained trombonist Kalia, Kalia Van, Van Ever wrote an article on her blog titled Token Girl, in which she describes not only sexual harassment and intimidation from musicians outside of and within her own band, but how, she, how her image was being used by the school's jazz studies program to create a sense of diversity, inclusion, and a safe space that didn't actually exist. So let's face it. The life of a jazz musician is challenging, and it can oftentimes be brutal. As a freelance ensemble-based industry, band members typically get their foot in the door by referrals through their buddies. There is rarely a formal hiring process in place or public postings for openings for the big band jobs or jazz ensembles. And considering the musical boys club that still persists around jazz, Women are often not even considered, even by some female band members. While X and Y chromosomes have never determined the quality of a person's musicianship, the gender gap extends beyond the music. As mastheads of leading jazz magazines show less than 10% of jazz critics and journalists are women and players' promotion and concerts and events hinge mostly on male-run booking agencies and jazz festival programmers. And yet, in kicking off the UNESCO's first International Jazz Day in April of 2017, Quincy Jones described jazz as the personification of transforming overwhelming Neg overwhelmingly negative circumstances into freedom, friendships, hope, and dignity. It's a nice, inclusive interpretation of the music, would you say? But as commercial business, jazz is among the most sexist sectors of the music industry. Now let's flip the script a little bit. Classical music. While it's not typically incubated in jazz's red light classrooms of clubs and bars, it provides an interesting counterpoint. In the 1970s, women accounted for less than 5% of classical musicians. Then, a musician's union instituted what they called blind auditions, which mandated that the identities of performance candidates be concealed from the jury in order to decrease bias, either conscious or unconscious. Today, 48% of symphony orchestras in metropolitan areas are women. In considering some of the most prominent jazz orchestras in the United States, like SF Jazz, or the Wynton Marsalis-led Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra, considered to be among the best paying gigs for an American jazz musician, has never once hired a permanent female member since it began 31 years ago. Now, there are efforts underway by jazz women and girls advocates 
a San Francisco nonprofit organization founded by Ellen Seeling. She's a professional trumpet player, educator, and band leader. And she's helping to institute blind audition policies throughout jazz orchestras. In fact, I was with Seeling in New York a few years ago when she made headlines summoning hundreds of musicians and female-led band leaders to a stage outside of jazz at Lincoln Center during a high-ticketed donors gala to advocate for blind auditions. Now, this isn't a vendetta that women have against men, but rather a social justice issue by women who love jazz and want to help preserve the art form. The overarching idea is that if jazz is more successful, inclusive and accessible, it can actually live up to the ideas professed in Quincy Jones's statement. And yet even after we celebrated the recent victory of a collaboration between jazz women and girls, advocates, and the jazz at Lincoln Center, which announced that they will be adopting blind auditions for hiring in its orchestra, with an agreement to post openings in all of the union papers and at colleges with large jazz departments, the support for jazz at major college and educational institutions is dwindling. At Spelman College, a selective historically black women's college in Atlanta, recently eliminated its jazz program. Saxophonist Tia Fuller, who you heard earlier, was a member who was also a member of Beyonce's band and has five albums as a band leader in her own right and actually is going to be the cover girl on the October issue of Downbeat Magazine, um, is a Spelman graduate. And she is now also a professor at the Berklee School of Music in Boston. Now, Fuller is proposing an exchange program between the two schools as a means of empowering women with mentorship, leadership, and cultural grounding that would help foster a distinctive experience for both musicians on both sides. While the future of that idea still remains to be realized, one thing is certain. The cultural and social sea change being demanded by women to foster more inclusion and understanding and acceptance in areas such as tech, science, and other industries is also a change that is needed in jazz. Admittedly, there's a more personal reason why I have to tell this story, because it's my story as a journalist. Loving the work and working in the profession where I've been told I don't belong. Daring to become a filmmaker and being asked what makes you think you can do this? It's my own, but can she play? I have to tell this story because it's my responsibility as a reporter, as a historian, and as a cultural inquirer to reveal the hidden stories of women. For if the future is indeed to be female, we've got to know where we come from and what we've cont contributed in all facets of our American story. And the men need to know it too. I have to tell this story because I believe, like Quincy Jones, that this music has the power to bring a sense of belonging and community. I have to tell this story because I have the audacity to believe that the music is better when we all get to play. And I remain very hopeful and optimistic that the work that women are doing to foster this sense of inclusion and belonging, be it in their own bands, in the classroom, as mentors and teachers with picket signs and protests are going to make that happen. And I'm thrilled today to introduce to you a young jazz musician, Tatiana Tate. She's a jazz trumpeter who began working with her instrument at the age of eight and Tatiana joins us via Skype from the band room at Cal State Fullerton, where she is a freshman majoring in jazz studies and minoring in Japanese. Hi, Tatiana. 
Hello. Can you see our lovely group of people assembled here? They're all waving. <laughs> Not yet. Oh, it's loading. It's loading. <laughs> So Tatiana, I gave them a brief bio about you, but I was curious if you could talk to the audience about what spurred your interest in playing the trumpet. Um, well, what spurred my interest, basically in music, is my older brother. Um, he started off a drummer, and all of a sudden he picked up the saxophone, and I saw how like great he was at it, and I, I, I don't know, I've always followed him in like everything he does. I followed him in sports, but I wasn't really great at it. And then I followed him to music, and I ended up loving it. Uh, my first teacher, she was a uh, brass instructor, and her trumpet was her favorite instrument. And she gave a trumpet to me, and I just I fell in love with it ever since because I think the trumpet represents my personality really well. Sometimes I'm like outspoken, but I can be soft at the same time, and I feel like the trumpet is the best instrument that replicates that. So can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to stick with the instrument? Well, the reason why I decided to stick with trumpet, actually I played multiple instruments. I played trombone, I played percussion, and I tried singing. Um, but one reason why the trumpet ranks true to me, um, honestly, was because of my teacher. Um, she had passed away my sophomore year of high school, and that really took a big impact on me. And I know she put a lot of faith into me, and she taught me a lot more than I could ever, you know, repay her. So that's a main reason why I've stuck with it. I honestly kind of do it for her. Mm. So that's the main reason why I've stuck with it. So besides your band teacher, um, who are some of your other role models in the music? Um, well, I guess one uh, current role model I have is uh, Esperanza Spalding. She's a uh, female jazz bassist, vocalist, and composer. She recently won a Grammy. She was the one who beat Justin Bieber a few years back. Like ever since then, I've been like looking up to her because she's really like going hard for the female jazz musicians. Mm -hmm. So, can you tell me a little bit about um, some of the projects that you've been working on? I want the audience to get to know a little bit more about you and um, continue to follow you as you go through your college and professional career. Well, um, in early March, I participated in the Washington Women in Jazz Festival. So that's basically a jazz festival devoted to women who play jazz. Lately, I've been working on bringing the jazz festival to LA. So hopefully in the next few years, we'll have a LA Women in Jazz Festival. So that's what I've been working on lately. I also have a female uh, quartet that I'm a part of. So we try to get together and travel around and like, you know, showing people about the female class session musicians and making our friends know. Is it unusual, you mentioned having um, your band teacher be a woman. Is it unusual to have a band teacher not only be woman, a woman, but a uh, brass player? It's honestly very common. I mean, within my own jazz program, I am one of two women and I am the only brass playing female within my major, within my jazz major. So it's it's not likely that you'll see most of us out there, but I'm trying to change the perspective of the instrument. I mean, I've been told growing up that the trumpet is a man's instrument, and I'm trying to change that stereotype. You recently, I saw on, uh, on the internet that you had a picture with Cora Bryant, who was actually the reason I loosely got into all of this. Um, can you talk about what she means to you as a trumpeter and what kind of legacy she has uh, provided for you? I mean, honestly, it was great hearing about Flora Bryant. It all, me hearing about her all started from people saying, have you heard of this female trumpet player? And I mean, there's not a lot of us around and I eventually looked her up and I noticed she was one of like the first African American females to go overseas and travel the circuit as a musician. So she's a pioneer way before my time. She's worked with Dizzy Gillespie and some of the great musicians, and they don't teach that in my school. And luckily, uh, my father ended up connecting with her, and she was willing to talk to me, and I got to play for her, and hopefully get some more mentoring from her. Well, um, would you mind playing a little something for us? Sure, OK. And what will you be playing for us today? Um, this is a jazz standard entitled There Will Never Be Another You, and it's by 
can be worn. So I'll play like melody and then I'll solo over it and go back into it. So I hope you guys enjoy. You do your thing. <laughs> when talking about the, the trumpet, that it could be both outspoken yet soft. And I thought that was a really beautiful way to describe your connection to the instrument. At what point did you realize that it provided you with that latitude or access to be both, and you didn't have to just be one, whether you know outspoken or soft? Well, I think it was in high school. That's when I realized what the trumpet can do and how it affected me. I was honestly, I'm a very, I was a very shy kid growing up, and now I'm really like outgoing and like all over the place. And I think it was in high school. My first solo that I ever took, my teacher had given me a horn, and I took one of the greatest solos of my life. I feel like I felt at that moment that every note was perfect. And I think that's when I realized that the trumpet was for me. And in that solo, I realized that I could be whatever I wanted to be. I guess if that kind of answers your question. I think it was in those moments that that's when I realized the trumpet was for me. And that's when I realized I can be both bold and outspoken. Because because of playing the instrument, I gained enough confidence to take a solo. So that was my boldness. Wonderful, thank you. I can answer that. <laughs> Tatiana, uh, my name's Joe. And what's what's your next step? Where are you, where are you going from here? Okay, my next step. Well, for the past few years, I've been playing uh, gospel trumpet professionally. So I've played at a lot of churches and like other community center events. Um, yeah, I'm starting a 
Let's go see that fucking cool cafe at Lamar Park. So I'm gonna take a combo that I have there. We're just gonna start, you know, playing around LA. Um, I'm coming out with an EP, so that's gonna consist of all of my favorite uh, gospel tunes on trumpet. So that's basically my next move. And I'm hoping to start teaching lessons. That's what I'm gonna do my next year. Start teaching lessons to kids and into the school district. So I can you know, just be. Um, I was actually just wondering if they gave you a reason why they said it was a man's like instrument. Like, did they just say that, or did they give you a reason for why that was expected of them? It just seems so silly as like a, a statement. Honestly, they never really gave me a reason. Um, from me to I've been playing trumpet since like elementary school. So when I came into middle school, not everyone was set on what instrument they wanted to play. But I were, I was already set. Like when I came into this grade, I'm like I play the trumpet. This is what I'm going to play. I'm not going to change. And I'm not sure why um, my instructor had said it. I don't know if it was to, I guess, discourage me from playing, but I am glad he said it. Every time I hear words of discouragement, it just only pushes me further. And I've heard words of discouragement in my entire life. I mean, not only do I play a brass instrument, I was a snare section leader, bass drum section leader. I was drum major in my high school. And it's like every time someone, people have always told me that I couldn't do these things. I was the first African-American female drum major at my school. People told me it wouldn't be done, and I did. My senior year, I was the first female to win one of our music scholarships, and I did that too. So honestly, I'm not sure why he said it, but now I'm glad that he said it. It's not very uncommon for, um, for uh, instruments to be sexualized. Um, by gender. Uh, brass instruments and drum and bass tend to be uh, considered masculine instruments. They tend to be um, the ones that uh, boys are encouraged to play. Uh, and it is, it's, it's historic. It has, it, it has its roots in the music. Um, and so the fact that Tatiana is still hearing this um, is why we need to break, it's really why I wanted to focus on this particular, this set of instruments. Yeah, and I guess I'll explain, because I, in middle school, wanted to play the trumpet, and then I was actually told to play the flute instead, because for some reason we needed another 14th flute player. <laughs> <laughs> so, but they never gave me an explanation why, and I'm so thankful that it turned out that way, because I went into the arts, and I love the arts, and like it was like a huge turn. It's like I decided purposely to go into like process making because of that art, um, because I was forced to play the like the flute. So I guess it's like a weird pathway, but it made me like this lecture totally made me think back on my memory of middle school and just like what I had been given as like an instrument to play. So it was it was it's fascinating like that this was yeah. a thing. And some of the some of the challenges of uh, young girls matriculating into, and that's why Tatiana's story is really intriguing to me because she had a woman who was there to mentor and educate and guide her along. And it's one of those things that women, uh, young girls, need is to have women as mentors and tutors and people that can empower them in the music. Um, and one of the great things about what Ellen Sealing is doing is that she has opened up a uh, camp for women and girls who want to play the music. And it is uh, led by uh, all women musicians because in a lot of the jazz camps, it's still predominantly male. And so I don't know why this still persists. Um, there have been, um, when I look back in history, one of the things Cora Bryant told me about uh, the trumpet and the trombone because it kind of puts a little cleft in your lip, a little indentation in your lip, but it wasn't considered sexy for women to have that little cleft in their lip. But guys have it, you know? so so it never made it never really made any logical sense to me. But it definitely is a stereotype that still persists. Uh, what do you think are the next steps um, uh, to increase the gender parity in in jazz music? The next steps, I mean, I'm taking a step personally. Like, I looked at my director and I'm like, okay, why aren't there any more women in here? And honestly, I'm trying to start going to like different school districts. That's my goal to like be able to like go to different school districts and do what I'm doing now play uh, for kids 
and lecture them and let them know like this instrument is okay for anybody to play. Because honestly, the sexism goes both ways. I know that a lot of my friends at school, males who play flute are told, oh, you know, you shouldn't be playing that instrument. But luckily, one thing that I do notice is once you get to the college level, like where I'm at now, it's kind of like a everything goes. No one really cares who you are, what you look like, or what you play, just as long as you sound good and you make everyone else sound good. So my next steps are just to educate, you know, people, just educate everyone. Hi there. I'm actually, I'm, I'm the middle school band director here. And I want to echo a lot of the things that you've seen and heard. Um, our classes are um, highly divided by gender. I have a lot of the boys in my room, and we have a lot of the girls in the strings. Um, so I want to commend you for the work that you're doing, and um, you know we'll keep fighting the good fight. I'm also a brass player, so I'm excited to hear you and um, just encourage you on your way. Um, you're always welcome if you want to come down and uh, come sit in on the jazz band here. We'd love to have you. So yes, yes, come on definitely. down. <laughs> We'd love to. So just, um, I don't have a question for you. I just want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. You're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for making me feel welcome here at La Jolla Country Day School. And I want to especially thank uh, Tatiana for coming and playing for us and talking to us and sharing her story. And uh, I'll catch up with you at Hot and Cool, actually. So. Um, I'll see you soon. <laughs> That's my alarm because I have class. I'm like, oh, it's okay. Thank <laughs> you.